Members, it's uh, finance, Senate, the Senate Finance Committee, April 4th. I had a long weekend, didn't I? Ooh. Um, really good to start our omnibus bills this week. For the record, we do have a quorum. Um, just want to lay out a little of what we're going to do this morning. Uh, there, we're going to go into a recess at 920 for the service awards. And we have Mr. Bodern and Mr. Stanley that are receiving service awards this morning. So that will uh, we'll, we'll recess at 920 and come back when they arrive. Um, can't do this job without them. So appreciate uh, your service also. That's, that's wonderful. Plan on being there. Senator Ingebrigtsen, we have Senate filed 4062, your environmental omnibus bill. Good morning, Madam Chair and, and members. Um, hope everybody had a good weekend. A little bit more of that white stuff on the ground, uh, but uh, it's all going to be dissipating. I'm going to be really quick today, I think. <laughs> you know how it is. It's a, As Thomas Sony would say, this is a good bill, so we really don't need a lot of discussion. But Senate file... 4062 before you uh, and the financial I think members you have the financial uh, sheets uh, in your packets they will look like that I'll have Mr. Mueller go through that and uh, also have Mr. Stanley here as well for for questions with regards to uh, any questions that you have uh, you also have uh, Bowser and and uh, Department of Natural Resource comments in your packets as well so uh, Madam Chair, this is the uh, the uh, uh, midterm, if you would, uh, uh, bill for the environmental natural resource finance. A uh, fair amount of work has gone into this. Uh, Senator Rood, <coughs> of course, you know, is the policy chair, and uh, I'd be the finance chair. And, and uh, this year, this this bill will reflect. Uh, uh, some of the needs that uh, we weren't able to finish and discuss in last uh, session, uh, which was last year for the, the budgetary session. But we do have a couple of uh, uh, budgetary issues here that pertain to the, uh, uh, as well as a couple of uh, uh, other, uh, my, <coughs> I think, minor um, uh, policy issues that we'll talk about. Uh, but with that, members, uh, uh, as you know, that's in, in uh, the purview of this committee is the, the Pollution Control Agency, Department of Natural Resources. Uh, again, you can you can see that as well as uh, other things. The only uh, uh, the target that I had, of course, you know, was a uh, uh, million four fifty, million four fifty, and I'll have um, Dan, uh, Mr. Mueller, describe that. And the rest of the money, as you can see, came from different funds throughout uh, throughout the uh, uh, the department. So, with that, Madam Chair, if I might, I'll turn it over to uh, Dan Mueller. Uh, We'll go through the financial. That sounds great. Thank you, Senator Ingerson. Mr. Mueller, to the fiscal note, um, please. Madam Chair and members, the spreadsheet is, a, as Senator Ingerson described, it's a one-page <clears throat> spreadsheet. Um, the general fund target that this bill is at is um, it's 1.47 million. It's one million of spending, and then there's a revenue change that um, reduces the general fund revenue by $470,000, and I'll get into that at the end. Um, the appropriations in the bill, there's a total of um, $7.8 million of spending in the bill. And I'll start with the Pollution Control Agency. Um, spends $3.8 million. Most of this is from the environmental fund. Um, there's appropriation for the Lake Town Lake Town Township Wastewater System Design, 86000 There's some additional money for score grants, 700000 per year, and that's ongoing. That's on top of the base, which is uh, $18.45 million. Um, so that, that's uh, additional money to a, a base program. A uh, whole effluent toxicity rulemaking is uh, 671000 one time, and there's some policy language later for that. There's a mattress recycling program in the bill. Um, the $96,000 here is to pay for a, uh, an employee at PCA, and this would not collect any state fees. Um, so the $96,000 is uh, sort of um, in place of a fee that would otherwise go to the state. Um, an air permit study is in um, 
uh, $50,000 to look at sort of the, how the air permit system is working in Minnesota compared to other states. Uh, the next one is $740,000 uh, from Senator Icorn bill for a Section 404 permit study, and this is going to the EQB. Uh, the last one here for PCA is uh, $1.5 million to clean up uh, or to knock down an abandoned school in Lake of the Woods County. And this is a state-owned uh, property right now and is has various contaminations, including asbestos and petroleum um, leakage in the ground, apparently. So they have requested uh, money to help knock down this um, uh, building and so it's 1.5 million dollars from the remediation fund those are the direct appropriations to uh, PCA that are in the bill there's two other changes in the bill that are from the governor's bill and one is extending a, a previous appropriation for st. Louis River mercury um, and that's just extending from the first year to the second year of the biennium so there's no general fund cost the next one is some 3m reporting changes and that just it goes it reduces the amount of reporting they have to do back to the legislature and that saves a little bit of money per year next we have a uh, department of natural resources um, the first one is a uh, from the ATV fund the first three are all from the ATV funds uh, first one is the Senator Johnson bill for Rozo ATV trail resurfacing the next two are from the Senator Bach bill well st. Louis County both are in St. Louis County, um, $500,000 each. Um, again, these three are all from the ATV account, and there's sufficient funds in that account for some of these one-time expenditures. The next one is a trail ambassador program from the off-highway vehicle account, and this is a $40,000 ongoing program. Um, the next one is shooting sports facilities grants. This is $150,000 on top of a uh, current $125,000 appropriation by well, the Senator Rood bill. The next one is a, dealing with a policy issue in the bill. It's a calcareous fen monitoring, $387,000 per year out of the Heritage Enhancement Account. And the last one is a $496,000 for a White Bear Lake water level study. This is a result of um, Senate file 3055 from Senator Housley that is already passed the policy committee and is on um, general orders and there's a late fiscal note on that bill that would uh, so this is paying for the study portion of that bill and the language is in the policy article um, for the rest the rest of the part of that bill the last item on the spreadsheet um, is dealing with uh, uh, the Department of um, Tourism and this would provide one million dollars for a large-scale events promotion this is one million dollars one time from the general fund and then the proposal also creates a new events promotions account which would use some of the lottery and lieu money that would otherwise go into the general fund and would deposit it in that account so ongoing it would right now appropriate four hundred fifty thousand um, dollars per year ongoing um, but the events promotion account would receive 470,000 the first year and then 490,000 in the out years and again that would reduce the amount of um, general fund revenue in the that's going to the general fund so on the last page here is just the totals by fund um, there's a million dollars of general fund appropriations 2.3 million of, of environmental fund appropriations uh, the remediation fund is a mix of that uh, knocking of the taking down of the school building and then the savings of the 3m reporting um, natural resources fund those are mostly the atv accounts and also the new events um, promotion account and the game and fish fund there is actually from the heritage enhancement accounts from the three items the shooting sports facility grants calcareous fans and white bear lake monitoring and then the last item I'll point out on the revenue changes is the we have the what's commonly called as the lands bill this is article 3 in the Senate file 4062 um, that creates about 1.6 million dollars worth of uh, revenue that goes into the land acquisition account 
and that then is automatically appropriated back to the DNR to spend at a later time for other land purchases. Um, so that's it for the spreadsheet. If there's any questions of that, I'll briefly go through a couple things in Article 1 in the bill. Um, Mr. Mueller, any questions, members, on the spreadsheet? Very good. Mr. Mueller. Okay, Madam Chair and members, I won't go through every item in Article 1 because a lot of it was covered by the spreadsheet. Um, the f first one I'll point out on page 3. This is the um, $50,000 per year that is going for an air permit study. And it's to study how uh, Minnesota's air permit system compares to other um, EPA Region 5 states, which are Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. And just to compare how Minnesota's system is funded compared to those other states. The next one I'll point out here on, on lines 4.6 is the appropriation for that um, school building in Lake of the Woods County. Again, this is a, and I'm, I'm doing some research on it to try to figure out how this became in, into a state ownership. But like I said, it was a school building that had a, the last class in the building was in 1973. And since then it's been used under various purposes, but has been largely abandoned for the last number of years, and the uh, county is asking the state to take this building down. Um, the appropriation on line 4.17 is the section, uh, section 404 permit study. Uh, the, this bill has this appropriation going to the Environmental Quality Board. The EQB is made up of commissioners that would be from the agencies that would be involved in this section 404 um, request and this would require the the state to ap apply for it's on um, lines 5.13 would require the state to to make an application to the federal government to uh, take over the permitting of section 404 um, permits The next one I'll point out is the appropriations that are from the heritage enhancement accounts on lines, uh, page seven. Um, paragraph E, F, and G, those are all from the heritage enhancement accounts in the game and fish fund. That money comes from the lottery and lieu sales tax, and there is a balance in those account, in that account to pay for these three appropriations. And the last item I'm going to point out here is on page 10. This is the extension of a previous appropriation. It's on line 10.18. Um, this was in the governor's bill. Slightly modified. The governor had this actually going over to the next biennium, which would have carried a cost. Um, so this just uh, extends it by one year, um, still within the biennium. And that's all I have for Article 1, and I think I'll turn it over to Mr. Stanley for Article 2. Thank you, Mr. Mueller. Madam Chair, members, good morning. Mr. I'm Ben Stanley, Stanley from Senate uh, Nonpartisan Staff. And what I'm going to do, Madam Chair, is just hit on the uh, provisions from Article 2, which is the main policy article that have fiscal implications. Each of these has a corresponding line on the spreadsheet that Mr. Mueller went over. And I'm just going to go through them quickly, and then I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. On page 32 is the first one. This is section 33, dealing with calcareous fins. Under current law, um, the DNR is prohibited from issuing a water appropriations permit if the appropriation would affect a calcareous fin in a negative way. Um, this section would require when DNR makes a determination uh, that they have to deny a permit because of its effect on a calcareous fin, they have to provide the applicant with an explanation, a hydrological evaluation is what it's called, of the basis of that decision. And the section would also give applicants the ability to request a third party review at no cost to themselves. And if that is, uh, does not lead to resolution uh, that's satisfactory, they could uh, file a contested case provision. 
The next section I'll bring to your attention is section 53. This is probably the biggest one in the bill. It starts on page 44 and goes through page 55. It would create a mattress recycling uh, program. Um, this is the one Mr. Mueller noted that there's a position associated with it because the PCA would have to do, approve various components of this program. Uh, and the way this would work is there would be a, a plan that would be created by mattress producers and approved by the PCA. And then what the plan would provide, sort of like what has been done with paint stewardship, um, you would have a statewide uh, network of places that would collect used mattresses and provide for their recycling. And, uh, you know, there's various requirements for PCA to approve things along the way, and so that's what that uh, position would do. The next provision I'll uh, bring your attention to is section 55, which begins on page 56. This was a governor's request to reduce to one from the current two the number of annual reports that have to be made uh, about expenditures from the account that holds the 3M settlement proceeds. The next section, Madam Chair, uh, it's actually two sections, section 62 and 66. These are found on page 67 and 71, respectively. The first of these, section 62, creates the events promotion account in the Natural Resources Fund. This is the account that's used for special events promotion in the state. And it goes with section 66, which provides that 1% of lottery and lieu proceeds would be put into the account. The next section I'll point out is section 69, Madam Chair. This is on page 75 and 76. This is a study that would be done by DNR and stakeholders uh, regarding ways to provide sustainable drinking water to the Northeast Metro. There was a cost associated with the study that Mr. Mueller mentioned. Uh, finally, in article two, section 72 and 77 deal with whole effluent toxicity. The way to think about this is whole effluent toxicity is an alternative way of assessing effluent from NPDES permittees. And under current law, it's used in the Lake Superior Basin only. What these sections would do is expand that to the entire state for sugar beet processing facilities. And Madam Chair, the only other thing I'll draw your attention to is Article 3, which I'm not going to go through section by section unless you want me to. This is the lands bill. Uh, Mr. Mueller noted that it would generate 1.6 million for the land acquisition account. And Madam Chair, unless there are questions, that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Stanley. I do not see any questions at this point. We'll go to Commissioner Stroman. And she is remote. Welcome. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning, Madam Chair. I'm just going to do a quick sound check, make sure you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you and see you. Wonderful. Excellent. Great. Well, um, good morning. My name is Sarah Stroman. I am the Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. And uh, I'm very pleased to be with you this morning remotely. And I'll note that Assistant Commissioner Bob Meyer is in the room with you today. So. Um, he can assist with any any questions. Um, but I do want to thank you for the opportunity, Madam Chair, to, to be here today to comment specifically on the Senate environment uh, omnibus bill. I also want to thank Chair Ingebretson and Chair Rood for and their committees for the work this session. DNR is committed to continuing to work with uh, you and the rest of the Senate on this bill. I'll make a few quick comments on Article 2 um, and the policy provisions of the bill. I know that's not the, the purview of the Finance Committee, but um, I do want to thank the Senate for including the lands bill and many of our policy provisions. These are important bills, and we're glad to see them moving forward in the environment bill. In, the, um, in addition uh, to the DNR's policy provisions, this bill includes some policy provisions on which we have concerns, and we've previously testified to those concerns. And we did submit a letter to this committee as well as Chair Inga Britson that outlines those concerns. So I'm not gonna elaborate here. I will instead focus the rest of my comments uh, this morning on the budget portion of the bill. The Madam Chair and committee, um, over the last two years, we've talked a lot about Minnesotans embracing outdoor activities in record numbers to manage stress and anxiety of the pandemic and to find solace in nature. 
So given the value that we're seeing Minnesotans place on our natural resources and outdoor spaces, we believe now is a time to invest and reinvest in those spaces and resources. We understand that the governor put forward an ambitious budget, and we believe it is a reflection of the importance of these investments to our ability to continue to serve Minnesotans. These are one-time investments that will allow us to advance the DNR's mission, address critical issues such as tree planting, habitat protection and restoration, and improving access to the outdoors, as well as address rehabilitating aging and in some cases failing infrastructure. There are also important investments for Minnesota's communities and our quality of life throughout the state. With a historic budget surplus, we have a once uh, in a generation unique opportunity for one-time investment in natural resources and outdoor recreation. We believe uh, it, it would be important for the Senate to seize this opportunity rather than let it pass by. And then finally, Madam Chair, I would also like to address uh, the importance of a public safety DNR enforcement deficiency proposal that the governor included in the revised supplemental budget. Um, this revised uh, recommendation covers 1.73 million in realized costs for public safety events that our DNR conservation officers assisted with um, in this uh, past period of time, particularly um, related to, to capital security. And I'll just um, remind this committee, I believe we had this conversation last year, uh, we cannot use the dedicated funds, uh, primarily game and fish funds, to cover these general public safety costs. So it is extremely important that our enforcement division uh, be reimbursed with general fund to make sure that they are whole. In closing, Madam Chair, um, I just want to thank you and this committee, as well as Senator Rood, Senator Ingebrigtsen, and their committees for the work to assemble this bill. And uh, I am here also to commit that we are ready to work with the Senate to take advantage of this once in a generation opportunity and finalize this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Questions, comments? Thank you for being with us this morning. I don't see any questions or comments. So again, thank you. And I hope you stick around just in case we do have some. And we have uh, Commissioner Kessler with us remote also. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair. Can you can you hear me? Yes, we can, and we can see you too. Okay. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Uh, thank you. For the record, I am Minnesota Pollution Control Agency Commissioner Katrina Kessler. Thank you, Chair Rosen, and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify remotely on Senate File 4062. I will note that we have MPCA Assistant Commissioners Cadelka, McDonald, and Vanderbosch as well as government relations and fiscal staff in the room with you today to answer questions. Um, the MPCA also appreciates uh, the opportunity to be here and the inclusion of a couple of the policy proposals from the government governor's bill, namely the extension of the Minnesota River Mercury TMDL appropriation and the adjustment to the 3M reporting re report frequency. And I just wanna to touch on a couple items from the Walls Flanagan budget for the MPCA that do not appear in Senate file 4062. The governor's budget request builds on strong bipartisan agreement from last session and moves Minnesota forward with smart strategic short-term investments that will secure significant long-term benefits and unlock opportunities from the federal bipartisan infrastructure law. Specifically on the climate piece, we know that mega rain events have become too common in Minnesota, washing out roads and flooding basements. Unfortunately, we now rank second in the country for extreme weather events and insurance rates in Minnesota, according to the Federation of Homeowners Insurance, have spiked 366% since 1998 because of these extreme weather events. And we know from personal conversations with mayors and public works leaders and county commissioners across the state, that leaders are looking for resources to help their communities prepare. So preparing for communities for resilience is nonpartisan. And the governor's budget builds on last year's bipartisan work to help communities plan for resilience by asking for 55 million to restore stream banks and shorelines, reduce flooding risks, upgrade parks and libraries and other community buildings and spaces to withstand weather events, including planting trees, and reducing local heat island effects. 
our grant proposal provides resources that communities and landowners are, are asking for to develop plans that can be leveraged again by several programs included in the bipartisan infrastructure law. Also missing from Senate file 4062 are MPCA's proposals to prevent waste prevention and provide recycling grants. We're hearing from city and county leaders across the state that they are experiencing solid waste challenges and public and private facility operators are interested in expanding recycling and reuse. We spoke in both the Senate policy and finance committees um, on a bipartisan nature about the need to prevent and the negative legacy of landfilling and the desire to increase funds for recycling and waste reduction. Our proposal would provide grants to support successful waste prevention programs for entities to innovatively explore alternatives around food waste, recycling market development, composting and anaerobic digestion, as well as reuse of construction materials. The grants would help state, local governments and private entities reduce waste, create jobs and make progress towards shared climate and sustainability goals. And lastly, missing from the bill are proposals to protect communities from PFAS. The forever chemicals can continue to unfortunately show up in waters and soil. Last fall, the MPCA announced for the first time that we found PFAS in fish in greater Minnesota waters, in, in waters including Lake Winona in Alexandria, and communities across the state continue to struggle by finding PFAS in drinking water wells. Last year, the MPCA announced that PFAS contamination is present in groundwater associated with nearly 60 closed landfills in 41 counties. So PFAS is not a Twin Cities program, or excuse me, a Twin Cities problem. It's not just a 3M problem. It's a challenge impacting almost every community in our state, and we need to make sure that we're meeting that challenge. The governor's budget includes $2 million for grants to help facilities remove and replace PFAS containing materials from their operations, as well as a one-time appropriation of $500,000 to better understand current levels of PFAS in Minnesota's waters and soil. While other states have taken a, he taken a heavy handed regulatory approach to PFAS, Minnesota is using data and collaboration to determine where and how PFAS are entering the environment. And we know that better data leads to better results and the governor's request accomplishes that. So thank you, Chair Rosen, again, for the opportunity to testify and to highlight some of the opportunities missing from Senate file 4062 and to share feedback that we're hearing from local government partners and businesses owners around the proposals that we have to grow our economy and address threats from extreme weather, as well as mitigating PFAS impacts. Over the past couple months, we've testified in the Senate um, Finance and Policy Committees on a number of these provisions. And we, we did send a letter with more detailed comments in hopes that it will aid conversations on the bill. And hopefully if it's not currently in your packet, it can be distributed to the members. And like Commissioner Showman, we are very committed to working with all of you to um, move forward uh, our shared goals. So at this point, I will turn it back to you, Chair Rosen. And again, we're here to answer questions. Thank you, Commissioner. I do not see any questions at this time. Let's go to Mr. J Jasky from Bowser, please. Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, Good morning. John Jasky. Thank you for being here in person. I appreciate that. Yeah, I appreciate nice being here. Um, John Jasky, Executive Director of the Board of Water and Soil Resources. Uh, Commissioner Stroman and Str Commissioner Kessler overall overviewed some of the you know kind of broad points that we were trying to get across to the committee Mr. today. Mr. Jasky, just really grab that microphone. Get it up there. Yes, thank you. Is this better, Madam Chair? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, and as Senator Ingebrigtsen had noted, we've got a letter in your packet, so I won't go through all those details, but just a few, to highlight a few things, uh, Madam Chair and Committee. Um, we are very uh, proud of the work we've done in partnership with local governments across the state for many years, and there, we know there's a lot more to do. Uh, there are two items in the bill specifically I wanted to highlight first that are voluntary conservation programs that we think are are ready to go. There's a strong demand for, for those and we can provide uh, additional federal dollars if we can get some state dollars to uh, pursue these federal programs. The first one of those is a water storage and treatment program, which is in the statute. This would allow us to address by holding water on the land instead of letting it zoom downstream, uh, protecting those streams, rivers, and lakes that are so important to Minnesota. 
Uh, the second item is also similar in that it is applied to the land, and that is soil health practices. Uh, we've seen a great deal of interest and demand for this kind of activity by farmers all over the state, and we're working with the University of Minnesota Department of Agriculture and others to make sure we're providing both the technical expertise, the financial assistance, and the peer-to-peer -peer training that's really important to make this work. And then a couple of items, Madam Chair. Uh, we have in the uh, statutes now a requirement for our agency to do a government-to-government -government coordination and collaboration with tribal governments. And so one of the things that was in the governor's recommendation was funding for a tribal liaison in our agency to provide that important connection to our 11 tribal nations. We also had in the governor's recommendation a request for some COVID relief dollars that would help us you know, bring back via contract some engineering services to some of the projects that were delayed or otherwise impaired by the time that we weren't able to work on those during the growing season in the last two years. <clears throat> And there is also a budget neutral policy change. We, we think it could be very helpful to allow us to manage our easements, some of the structures on those to make sure we can repair and fix those before they become a, a bigger problem with greater costs. Question is held. And then finally, there is a provision that's in the bill, and Mr. Mueller identified it, I think, on line 4.17, that is an appropriation to the EQB for work by all three of our agencies to, to do the continuation of that 404 assumption process. And we we we'll would be glad to work with uh, the Senate on a version of that to move forward. We think that's an important opportunity for Minnesota to make sure we're doing good protection and doing it efficiently. Two, three, Betsy Hanhill. Madam Tessin, Chair, members, we look forward one, two, to working two, with Senator Ingebrigtsen and Tessin, Senator one, two, Root and, and any one, two, other committee one, two, members who have uh, we'll been part of this bill um, to make sure we make it the best we can for Minnesota going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jasky. Do not see any questions for you, so thank you very much for being thank you. here. Senator Ingebrigtsen, you have some amendments? I'm sure I do. Uh, I'll have the uh, two staff members who are coming forward right now. Um, it should be mentioned, uh, I think in, in a note, maybe I can do this in my final comments, so why don't I wait for that, uh, some of the concerns uh, that the DNR as well as the uh, MPCA have made, and I can address some of those issues. Uh, and looking more at the governor's, the governor's requests, I think is quite important uh, to note. Uh, so I'll, what I'll do, Madam Chair, if I may, of course, this, uh, this being a short, short session, we do have some changes uh, that, that could implicate some dollars. Um, uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to offer the, the uh, A-17 uh, amendment first, Madam Chair. Senator Ingebrigtsen moves the A-17 amendment. Who would like to explain that, Mr. Potter or Mr. Stanley? Mr. Stanley, please, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, members, this concerns an amendment that was uh, put on the bill in the last committee stop dealing with the public waters inventory. There was some committee discussion about that amendment, and the A-17 uh, sort of changes two of the three components of that amendment. That amendment uh, dealt with environmental review of projects that affect waters that are not on the public waters inventory. And it changed uh, the circumstances in which a mandatory EAW is required, a discretionary EAW is required, and a petition-related EAW is required. And what the amendment does is uh, gets rid of the changes with respect to the discretionary and the petition-related EAW. So the sum total of all of that is if this amendment's adopted, then what would remain of that change that was made at the last committee stop is that where a project would affect a water that is not on the public waters inventory, a mandatory EAW would not be required, but a discretionary one could still be required, as could a uh, petition-based EAW under the same circumstances as can happen today. Thank you, Mr. Stanley. And for the record, the... Um all these, we have four amendments before us, all have been posted and emailed out. So, any questions on the A-17 amendment? Senator Marty. Madam Chair, I'd like to amend the amendment to delete the first sentence in the paragraph as well. On the amendment? Uh, yeah, Madam Chair, it would be simply instead of page beginning line 19, it would delete line 17 through 26. 
And Senator Murray. And Madam Chair, that would that's that would take out the additional exemption from the EAW for um, any projects that are not listed on the public waters inventory. So it's it's just going a little bit further than the amendment does. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Uh, Madam Chair, um, I would uh, like Mr. Stanley to describe the difference and what this would do to the amendment. Mr. Stanley. Madam Chair, members, uh, what Senator Marty is proposing is to, in effect, uh, undo the adoption of the amendment from the last committee in its entirety. And if that, uh, if that change is adopted, the net result would be to leave unchanged the rules governing uh, when an EAW is required for a project affecting waters that are not on the public waters inventory. on that Senator Ingo Britson Madam Chair I would ask that the uh, committee uh, not vote in favor of that amendment okay, that you. would change it totally All right. Senator Marty moves the amended a 17 amendment to delete 1.2 is that correct all those in favor of that motion say aye 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 all those opposed say nay no. Nay. Motion does not prevail. Back to the A-17 amendment. Senator Inge Britson renews his motion on the A-17 amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those aye. opposed? Nay. 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 The motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Senator Inge Britson. Madam Chair, I would like to offer the A-18 amendment, and I will have Mr. Mueller explain that. Mr. Mueller or Mr. Stanley? Mr. Mueller? Um, Madam Chair, I'll explain the, the first part of the amendment. The, this amendment is requesting another $250,000 appropriation be added to the bill. It, it, however, is coming from the environmental fund, and there's a room in that fund to fund this. It is a one-time appropriation for the Red River Basin Commission to uh, look at the adaptive phosphorus management for the Red River of the North. Um, so the appropriation, again, is $250,000 one time from the environmental fund would go to a pollution control agency, which then would um, give the grant to the Red River Basin Commission. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Stanley if he's got anything to add to the policy part of it, of the amendment. Mr. Stanley. Madam Chair, members, I really don't have much to add. Um, as Mr. Mueller said, this would just require an assessment, uh, a feasibility assessment for adaptive phosphorus management on the Red River. Subdivision 2 towards the bottom of the page would create an advisory group uh, to work on that, and then Subdivision 3 would require a report of the results. Very good. Any questions on the A18 amendment? Senator Ingebrigtsen, did you move the A18? I'm sorry. Did you move the A18 amendment? Uh, yes, to I make did. Make a motion. Okay. Yep. I do not see any questions. Senator Ingebrigtsen removes renews his motion on the A18 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. The motion prevails. The A18 is adopted. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Madam Chair, I do believe uh, Senator Johnson may have an amendment to A15. Senator Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I do have the A15 amendment. Senator Johnson, would you like to move the amendment, please? Yeah, I will move the A15 amendment. And to the amendments, and Mr. Stanley. Madam Chair, members, the A15 uh, deals with PFAS monitoring, and it would simply say that where the Pollution Control Agency requires a person to uh, undertake PFAS monitoring, they would either be required to ensure that it doesn't cost the entity anything or they'd be required to reimburse the uh, entity required to do the monitoring. There are also some uh, clarifications starting on lines 10 through 14 to make it clear that nothing in this section would prohibit voluntary compliance with the monitoring request um, and nothing in this section would interfere with pre-existing PFAS monitoring. Senator Johnson, any comments on the amendment you'd like to make? 
Sure, Madam Chair. This this is a program that came out uh, pretty recently and caught a lot of uh, entities, uh, cities, and others by by surprise to the to the degree that uh, they're going to be paying for for the testing themselves in, in this program. Uh, those tests can range anywhere from five hundred to three thousand dollars per test for water tests, and up to thirty thousand dollars for air tests. This is a pretty heavy burden on a number of those small towns and entities that will be required to do this. So this is this is simply saying that if they're required to participate, that that the PCA will be um, required to pick up the cost for those entities uh, that that are falling to the jurisdiction of that of that plan. Thank you, Senator Johnson. Senator Marty. Madam Chair, this strikes me as one that says we're going to monitor it, but if you don't feel like it, you don't have to. I mean, this is giving them no funding to provide to the local governments. Basically, the agency is not going to be able to cover this. So, in effect, they're saying, well, you can voluntarily comply with the requirement if you want. Otherwise, nothing. I, I don't think this is the way we should be doing it. If, if Senator Johnson thinks that the state should cover the cost, should appropriate the money for it, not just say you got to tell them they don't have to do it. Thank you, Senator Marty. Senator Camp. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to echo what um, Senator Marty just said, and I want to add to it the perspective of the East Metro of the Twin Cities. Um, we are living with this. We are living with this daily. In, uh, in the East Metro and all of our communities. Uh, we have water wells going down on a regular basis. This is real, this is serious. And I think it is a huge mistake to, we should, we should fund it, we should support these communities, but we need to figure out a way to do this because it's, this is, as, as, the, as Commissioner Stroman said in her, in her remarks, this is not just a Metro problem. We know this is across our country and our state. Um, and so uh, I think this, is a, a, this, this amendment is a big mistake. Thank you, Senator Kent. No, sure. Senator Johnson, comments to that? You good? I'll, I'll follow up quickly with that. I, th I think we have funded uh, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency to do just this sort of work. If, if they want to really focus in on PFAS, they should direct their dollars and pri prioritize them for this type of work. Our communities are trying to provide for basic infrastructure for our citizens across the state. And this was not something that was built into their budgets and comes to be a bit of a surprise for them and hard to pay for. So I think this is only fair. If we want to protect those individuals that MPCA is uh, commissioned to protect, they should prioritize their dollars to do so. This is just a common sense sort of a, a, an amendment that we should be focusing on. So that's all I've got, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Johnson. Senator Johnson renews his motion on the A 15th Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay? No. The motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. So, members, it is close. We have one more amendment, the A 14, which we will pass out, but I think we're going to go ahead and go into recess. So, our. Madam Chair, if I could, just one quick comment. Oh, yes, absolutely. Madam Chair, with Senator regard to the Prince. last amendment, uh, the committee certainly certainly committed to working with the MPCA with regards to moving forward. But understand the ones that are being monitored now, they're still being monitored, are being paid for. So this does not have anything to do with that. I just wanted to add that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Ingebrigtsen, for that clarification. Uh, we will allow for the service program to go ahead and receive your award. Thank you, Mr. Bodder and Mr. Stanley. With that, we are in recess. And it'll probably take at least 40 to 45 minutes. <laughs>